Going to the cloud. Okay, we're going to talk about chapter nine, which is foreign exchange markets. Oh, you'll like it because it's quantitative, fairly heavily quantitative. <laughs> and when I was going over it yesterday, I thought, well, they say they like quantitative. Here we go. Foreign exchange. Um, it can affect the profitability of U.S. companies, even if they only have U.S. operations. And they've got a couple of examples. U.S. resort competes with European resorts, even though the U.S. firm doesn't do anything. So if the dollar strengthens against the euro, the cost to come to the U.S. goes up and they may not come. There's another one. Boeing sells planes to a Brazilian buyer for 15 million when the dollar's worth two reals. So that's 30 million reals. If the dollar strengthens, the price goes up to 37 and a half million. It's a big leap. That they might decide to, if they're the euro's good, they might decide to go with Airbus. So it can affect our companies even though they're not actually doing business necessarily. That's from 2012. We imported 3.3 trillion. We exported 3.0 trillion. Um, that's not good. The balance is wrong. Yeah, the balance is wrong. If we import more than we export, then the supply of our currency in the foreign exchange market exceeds the demand, and that depreciates our currency, which is not a good thing. Now, here's an example on Toyota. They sell Camrys for $23,000 when the exchange rate's 90 yen to the dollar. So they get 2 million, 70,000, seven, yeah, 70,000 yen. If the dollar weakens and it's only worth 80 yen, then they'll only get a million eight. So for them to get the same amount, they have to up the price by the, by the difference in the exchange rate, 12 and a half percent. So now the price is 25,875 if they want to get the same yen out of it. Okay, a lot of firms that, that do business internationally, they hedge their foreign currency exposure. They can do it with derivatives, swaps and futures, which we're going to look at in chapter 10. They can borrow money in the same currency in which they're earning revenue. And they can locate production facilities in the country. That's kind of tricky. Um, and the, the advice on that usually is don't locate a, don't build a facility that builds a finished product. Build a facility that builds a part. So it's not worth being nationalized, being taken over. See? If it only builds a part, then it's not worth taking over. If it builds a finished product, it's worth being nationalized. Okay. Foreign exchange markets. That's what we want to talk about. This is where you trade one, exchange, one currency for another. There's a spot market, there's a futures market, and there's a forward market. Spot market is today, forward and futures is obviously in the future. It does facilitate foreign trade. It does allow raising capital in foreign markets. It does transfer risk. And some people just speculate on it. If you think the dollar is going to weaken, you can speculate on that. I actually had a student uh, in an investments class many years ago who uh, traded foreign currencies at night from home. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, if you look at, if you think of it this way, a foreign exchange rate is nothing more than the price of one currency in another. It costs you, for a dollar, you can get 80 yen. Okay, here's the foreign exchange market, and you can look here and see, between 1989 and 2016, it's really shifted a lot. It grew a lot, but it's shifting, shifted from spot to forward transactions. And spot is really not normally instantly. It's really like two-day settlement, whatever. Okay. The exchange rates can be listed two ways, direct or indirect. Direct is U.S. dollars to the foreign currency. Indirect is the other way around. So if you look up there at the Canadian dollar, direct is 77.09 cents, U.S. dollar cents, to one Canadian dollar. Indirect is 1.2972 Canadian dollars to the US dollar. If you look at it right there, they're just reciprocals of each other. Take either one and, and divide it into one and you get the other one. Most of them are gonna be um, quoted as direct because most things are quoted in US dollars. Okay, here's the big currency traders overall. Probably nobody there um, you hadn't heard of. I actually don't know who. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know who that is. That's Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. I know who that one is. Yeah. Citigroup, JP Morgan. I think everybody, I don't know who that is. That's a new one. Yeah. Okay, the problem with foreign exchange risk, there is risk involved. It may move against you. The, 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 the exchange rate may move against you. It can move for you and it can move against you. Currency depreciation, that's when the country's currency falls in value relative to another currency. If you look at the dollar versus the pound, if right now it's $1.60 to the pound and it goes to $1.80, that means it cost us $1.80 to buy a pound. So the dollar has depreciated versus the pound because the cost to buy a pound went up. Foreign goods become more expensive. If it appreciates, it goes the other way. Let me move this little guy somewhere. Come on, little guy, get down there. There you go. If it goes the other way, if the currency appreciates, it takes less to buy it. Go, why are we not going? Can I do something? Who knows? Anyway, this is an example in your book. Uh, July, U.S. firm plans to purchase 3 million Swiss francs worth of Swiss bonds from a Swiss financial intermediary in a month. Current spot exchange rate, one, Smith, one Swiss franc to $1.0175. If they think the exchange rates are going to move against them, they can decide to buy the francs now on the spot market, $3,052,000. If a month later the deal falls through and they convert back and look at what the exchange rate, the exchange rate, Swiss franc is depreciated. So they're going to lose money when they go back because the exchange rate moves against them in the meantime. They could have used a forward contract at the same time. There was the spot rate, that's the forward rate. They buy three million at the spot rate and they sell it forward at the forward rate. Look, the forward rate is higher than the spot rate. So they buy at 175, they sell at 193. Now that only works if they don't actually need the money. Make sense? They bought them now, they're gonna sell them back. They have, so they have to go through the selling them back. Okay, this is using the firm's balance sheet. And I have got these in, a, that spreadsheet is posted out as an exhibit. Okay, on the asset side, they've got US one-year loans and UK one-year loans in pounds, showing them both in dollars. On the liability side, US CDs. They're balanced, everything's a year, currency composition, everything's balanced. Here's our rates. CD rate is at 8%, default free rate nine, UK rate 15, and exchange rate at the beginning and the end, exchange rate did not change, $1.30 to the pound. So here's what happens. Here's your data. At the beginning, it says sell. What they're saying is they converted 81.25 million pounds to dollars to pounds. And then they loan those out at 15%. Why not? In the year, end of the year, they get that 62.5 back at 15%. And they convert it back at the dollar thirty rate because it hadn't changed. So there's what they get. If the, if the currency exchange rate didn't change, they make 15 on the UK, they make nine on the US, and they had to pay eight on the CD. So they profit or loss was about four. Now we're gonna look at it. I don't know why that came up. I'm going to watch. Okay, what happens if the pound depreciates? It goes the other way. We're gonna look at depreciate and depreciate. Same setup up here at the top, except at the end of the year, the pound has depreciated to $1.18. Do the same thing at the beginning of the year. You get the 15 back. But look when you convert it back. Now it's 84,812. So now you've lost money because you lost because when you converted back, it was at a much lower rate. So now you've lost. What if the pound appreciates? Now you're going to make a lot more. Because when you convert it back, you're getting $1.40 for each one of those pounds. So now you're going to make 842. Now, wasn't that quantitative? Don't we like this? Mm. 
Probably did. Yeah. Yeah, I think we did. Okay. Foreign exchange markets. They operated under the gold standard during most of the 1800s. The United Kingdom was the dominant place. The gold price, the gold uh, price was fixed in London. That was the main trading for gold. Bretton Woods Agreement, 1944. It fixed exchange rates between in a 1% band. It ended up with some overvalued, some undervalued. Smithsonian, 71, Smithsonian 2, 73. What they've done is, under, and that's where we are, Smithsonian Agreement, it's managed float. What they mean is the exchange rate is allowed to free float, but central banks can step in and buy and sell to try to, just like the um, Federal Open Market Committee moves in and buys and sells to make, them, make it come around, that's what they're talking about, managed float. It is the largest of all the financial markets, 4.8 trillion a day. It operates 24 seven round the clock. Used to be you could only do it through banks. Now it's over the counter, electronic trading. Every one of you could do it right now. And interestingly, over 90% of the contracts are settled with delivery. Now, if you think about that, when we contrast that with the futures market, which we're gonna look at in chapter 10, most of those contracts are not delivered against. They're closed out prior to delivery. 90% of these are delivered which means there wasn't a lot of speculation in there. They actually needed the money one way or the other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. London is still the largest center. New York is second. Singapore's third. Singapore's a huge trading center. Okay, here's your the spot in futures again, spot and forward. There is a futures market in currency. The forward, the difference between forward and futures, which I guess we get to in eh, yeah, probably the next chapter. They're kind of the same thing. Futures are exchange traded and standardized. Forward is where you um, work out the deal, say, with a, with a bank saying, you know, in 92 days, I need 4,522 pounds. I mean, it's a weird amount. It's a weird number. And you, you work out a specific deal. <clears throat> Spot, a needed exchange. And there's our little example again, where they're talking about the direct and the indirect. So now we've got the Euro, European Community. It was actually formed in 97. You can see they consolidated, which I had never heard of, coal and steel, economic market, and atomic energy community. Maastricht Treaty of 93 set the stage for them to move toward the Euro and the European Central Bank. And you've seen all of the, um, the fuss about the United Kingdom never went to the Euro. S Switzerland didn't either. They did not go to the Euro. Um, and now they're trying to get out of this. The euro is the currency. Um, Again, trading in January, and they've all fixed. You, it sounds like it would be good because you don't have those currency problems anymore crossing borders. And the currency is really pretty. If you ever seen it, it's real colorful. It's very pretty. Um, a lot, a lot of the problem has been with the European Central Bank uh, setting everything for all of these countries. Some of them don't like it. Don't like that kind of control. Well, in the mid 80s, the dollar depreciated against the euro. The euro, as you might imagine, has become quite a, a popular currency in trading, I guess you'd say. We're gonna talk about interest rate differentials here coming up. Yeah, there you go. Central Bank of Russia has replaced some of their reserves with the euro, so has Chinese Central Bank. Used to be the only reserve currencies were the pound sterling and the US dollar, and the euro is now one. There you can see. In 2016, almost 44% was in dollars compared to 15.6 in euros. That's probably changed quite a bit and gone to euros. There. Uh, China. China's currency is called the yuan or the renminbi. Um, and they've started um, allowing their currency to float freely. Uh, it, you know, let me put the rest of it up there. It's usually pegged to either the euro or the dollar. Uh, and they have allowed Hong Kong to begin trading the euro offshore. They've also allowed um, Chinese-based companies to use the, euro, the yuan off the mainland. And America was allowed to start trading it. You couldn't, I don't think you can have euro, yuan. And they can't have American dollars. Chinese people cannot have American dollars. You, you can't like buy stuff from people on the street. 
they can't take American money. That's illegal. You go to something called the Friendship Store, which takes American Express. Let me just go there, <laughs> conveniently enough, and MasterCard and Visa, and they'll ship it to you. Um, foreign companies can settle investments accounts on the mainland in Yuan, and there it is, the other one, the, the Renminbi. They started trading futures. So it's coming more out from China, but before it was extremely insular. You know, it's, a, it's accepted reserve currency. The yen, pound sterling, the euro, and the US dollar are reserve currencies. Okay, during the crisis, well, the US dollar increased against major currencies and a lot of investors came over. When investors want to go for safety, they go, they go to US treasuries. It's, it's safe harbor. After our financial crisis, the dollar began to fall, problems there. Yeah, we, we're generally all right right now. Okay, let's talk about the risk. Yeah, risk involved with a foreign exchange transaction is that the value of the currency changes relative to the dollar, changes against you. You just saw those examples of what can happen. If they make an investment in a foreign country, they convert the domestic currency to the foreign currency at the spot rates invest in the foreign country, and then repatriate the money back at the spot rate. That's exactly what we saw. The only difference in our example was oh, they, got, they had interest there. Here's some more good quant coming up here. On balance sheet hedging and using forward contracts to hedge. On balance sheet, these are posted out there. Same setup before, CD rate, at the beginning of the year, they convert the 81.25 to pounds and loan it out. At the end of the year, if I could point to it, they get their money back and convert it back. But they have to repay the loan because they borrowed 81.25 at 11 and they have to pay that back. They convert that back. Overall, they make 2.315. If it, there, I should have remembered what I had little clickies on. Is it not? Yeah, there we go. Okay, if it goes the other way, the pound depreciates. Right there. Goes from $1.30 to $1.40. Same setup, except now when you convert back, you get a lot more dollars. So now, there. Are y'all just loving these? I'm not hearing any. Hmm? You're good, you're good. These are posted out there as Excel spreadsheets. So you can actually see where all these calculations came from. <laughs> I wouldn't put this, I, there's not gonna be it. Hmm. Yeah, I had to go through them two or three times to be sure I was ready to talk about it. Because I mean, I've seen it before, of course, but I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, obviously there wouldn't be any problem this huge on a test, that, that's not possible. But I want you to understand the concept of if the if the dollar or the pound, if the dollar appreciates or depreciates, what can happen to you? That's the point of it. Let me get that off. This is hedging with forwards. Same setup we had before. UK loans, same rates, exchange rate. There, the pound depreciates versus the dollar. So there's our forward. Do the same thing you did before, convert. You've sold the interest and the principal forward. Convert it back. Y'all are going to need to go look at these probably. Mm -hmm. I'll pull them up here in a second. Okay. Well, this is out there too. I won't. I'll go ahead and finish this and then I'll pull them up. We, we can look at the actual spreadsheets. Foreign exchange exposure. It is net exposure. Foreign exchange assets minus liabilities plus bought minus sold. Long or short, duh. Here's what they look like here, look at this. From 93, liabilities exceeded assets, now we're the other way. Assets far exceed liabilities. Okay, why would they have a position in foreign exchange markets? Because they have customers that are doing international trade. They have customer investment, they have customers hedging. Companies can just speculate. Who was it years ago that got in trouble for speculating? Dell, I think it was Dell. Computer people got in trouble for speculating 
they were supposed to be hedging and they were speculating in the market. They were supposed to be hedging Dell's exposure. Okay, here's our parity relationships. There's two parities, purchasing power parity, interest rate parity, and the international Fisher effect. Purchasing power parity says that the change in a foreign currency exchange rate changes as inflation rate changes. So this is the in interest rate in the US. This is the nominal rate right here. Think about what this is. This is our risk-free rate plus the inflation, expected inflation plus the risk-free rate. Okay, that's inflation, that's the risk-free rate. This is the foreign country, same exact setup over there. Any foreign country. Assuming that they're equal across, then the difference in the inflation premium should explain the difference in the rates. They're just solving that equation around. Finally, it says that the change in the rate is proportional to the difference in the inflation rates. So that difference, where that's a spot rate, the, for, the foreign spot rate, yeah, I think I got that right. Okay, here we go. Here's the example. U.S. ruble exchange rate, it's 0.1, 1.7 cents to the ruble. Russian inflation, seven and a half, our inflation, 0.8. If you plug in that right there, that's what you get. The change should be the 0 0.008 minus the 0 0.075 times that. That should be the difference. So the new rate should be that. Y'all should be loving this. It's numbers, it's got a formula. <laughs> We're not loving it yet. Okay, here's the international Fisher effect. It says differences in exchange rates for any time period T between two countries should be related to the exchange rate changes. So here you've got the interest rate in the given country, I, and that's the exchange rate in terms of U.S. dollars to foreign currency. There's your formula. The implication is the country with the higher interest rate will see its currency depreciate and vice versa. And our last one, interest rate parity. This is the theory that domestic interest rates should be related to the foreign interest rate, the spot exchange rate, and the forward exchange rate. And there it be. Using the British pound, this is our rate, interest rate. This is the foreign rate. That's the interest rate in the UK, and that's the forward rate. What we're looking at here is we're solving for, the forward, for what the forward rate should be. One plus the US rate is equal to that divided by that right there times 1.005 times that one. That's your answer. So subtract one from it. There you go. Now the question, with, if you've got that, is that the same one? I can't remember if it was. No, it's not. I'll go back. Okay. If the U.S. rate, this one right here, is 9%, that one right there is 11%, and that right there is $1.60, what should that be? This is your algebra skills related here. Solve for the unknown. Plug it in. The forward rate should be $1.5712. What if it's not? What if it's, let's go to the next slide. What if it's $1.55? You could borrow at 11% in the UK, owing $1.11, a pound and 11 back. You could sell the pounds at $1.60 and invest, and then you could buy them back at the forward rate. Arbitrage. Now, two cents per pound doesn't sound like a lot, but if you do it with a lot of money, it's a lot. And we get you there. And that's what it looks like. Did y'all just love that? I'm not seeing happy faces here. It is a lot of fairly heavy quant in there. Let me get the examples up. Okay, this is 9-2. Where we got the money up there, this is the income on the loan. It is that right there times 1 plus the 15% rate. Converts it back at the $1.30. There's the difference. That minus that, which is what you start 
you know, what you started with. That's dollars. That's dollars. So that's your gain. If you go down to the, whoop, too far. Go down to this one. This is where the pound depreciated versus the dollar. Exact same setup. And in part C of that, all three of these were in the slide thing. There you go. In the slide presentation. End of year. Same thing. Nine three. It's basically, I mean, these are not very big, are they? There we go. Okay. Let me set the split. So that'll be up there. They've got the same setup. There, pound sterling. There's your 2.315. I think if you all go look at these, that would be my suggestion and kind of see where the numbers are coming from. Uh, can it actually be warm in the building today? Something must be wrong with that. <laughs> it's gotten extremely cold outside. 41. I know. I can't believe it. Get out my puppy coat. A bigger, a bigger puppy coat. Okay. Let me just look at this one. It says sell, but you're actually converting them. So you're taking that right there and dividing by the exchange rate. Exchange rate. Whoop. That right there. C15. Divided by C15. And you loan them out. This right here is this over here, neg negative of it, times 1 plus C13. Because you're getting the risk-free rate, 15%. You're converting it back at the 118, and you, re you loan that out at 11, so you're repaying it. And you convert those pounds back to dollars at 118. I'm hoping these are all being out there. Here's the other one. And 9.5 is out there. How I did that. And 9.6. Interest rate parity. And interest rate parity. That, that's the spreadsheet, the balance sheet example. That's the other example. I would say I would go through them in more detail, but I think you need to go look at them first. And we can talk about them again. Because it is kind of involved. Um, but the whole, the whole point of the whole thing is if the interest rate moves against you, you can lose money. <laughs> if the interest rate moves for you, you can make money. If it doesn't move at all, the one that doesn't move at all, this one I think, it doesn't move at all, you can make money. But if it moves, if it depreciates, you can lose. If it appreciates, you can gain. And unless you have a crystal ball, you don't know which way it's going to go. So that's kind of a, what to take into account here. Questions about chapter 10? I mean, nine. You just loved it. I know you did. I can see it in your faces. You told me you didn't like the, quanti the qualitative questions, so you like these better? It's got numbers? I'm seeing one nodding, <laughs> one nod yes here. <laughs> okay, like I said, th there's no way there would be a problem. Now, one of these and one of those probably would be, one of those and one of those, purchasing power parity, those would probably be on a test because that's a one simple formula, one formula. A setup like this is way too involved to set that whole thing up on a test. So I might ask some part of it, but not, not all of that. But the illustration is good to show you what can happen. Okay, I guess, let me look at this. Let's look at the the questions that go with this, and then we can, um, I don't think there's too many problems. Uh, the first question is, effect of Bretton Woods. We just looked at it. Bretton Woods, 1940, it was in, where is it? Bretton Woods is here in the U.S. somewhere, um, up like New Hampshire, someplace like that. 1944 is right at the war, end of the war. It set a band on exchange rates. They couldn't move. Smithsonian Agreement and what they call Smithsonian II, came in and eliminated that. It allowed what they called managed free float. If a currency is allowed to free float, it just moves with the market. It's what we would consider just open market. It just moves. Managed float says that, there, right there, central governments may still intervene in the market directly 
to change the direction and movement. And, you, and they do. There you go. And there's the euro. The Va Vatican City pegged their exchange rates together called the euro. And I'm sure y'all have seen on the news that um, the said Great Britain did not, they joined the European Union, they did not go to the euro, and now they're trying to get out of the European Union. What's amazing about it is they voted on that in June 2016, 2016, mm -hmm. and they're still not out. No, 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 no. Okay, if interest rate parity holds, then it is not possible to borrow and lend in different currencies and take advantage of the differences in interest rates because the spot and forward rates will adjust. If a disparity exists, anytime you have a disparity in pricing, an arbitrage opportunity exists. If you can figure out how to take advantage of it. We all know what arbitrage is, right? Arbitrage, it's when the same thing is selling for different prices in different markets. Suppose, simple example, suppose right out here in the hall, they're selling two liter Cokes for $1.50 but right down at the family dollar, they're selling them for a dollar. You would go down there and buy all you could for a dollar and come up here and sell them, right? And it wouldn't take long before the market moved in. That's an arbitrage opportunity because prices are out of sync in two markets. Well, if interest rates are out of sync, you can take advantage of it. If US rates or interest rates are lower than foreign rates, the forward dollar value of the foreign currency will be less than the dollar spot dollar value, and you can earn more in foreign markets. I know you have to think about that. Oops, those are the only questions. This chapter did have, it didn't have a lot of um, terminology, I don't think. And the main one in there, Bretton Woods and Smithsonian Agreement with the two, Bretton Woods, interest rate parity and, okay, let's take five and we'll come back and do the problems. And I'll go get your guest. Okay, this problem is very much like the example, examples that were in the book. Oops, let me get it up. Oops. There we go. Okay, oh, it's a long one. Suppose the U.S. Fi uh, financial intermediary has the following assets and liabilities. There they are. 300 million in U.S. loans, one year. 200 million in German loans one year in euros, and 500 million in US CDs one year in dollars, which means their maturity, is they're all a year, so they're balanced, and obviously their assets and liabilities balanced. Okay, part A. Uh, well, they tell us, promise one year US CD rate is 4% uh, to be paid in dollars at the end of the year. Uh, one year default risk-free loans in the US are yielding 6%. Default risk Three one-year loans are yielding 10% in Germany, and the exchange rate at the beginning of the year is a dollar ten. It says to the pound, but it's to the euro. To the euro. And I'm looking in the book, and it shows pound, but it's not. It's euro. Um, so it's not going to change. But part A: calculate the dollar proceeds from the German loan at the end of the year and the return. Blah blah blah. If the spot rate doesn't change, okay. This is exactly what we did. They converted the 200 million up there to euros, dollars to euros, and they loan the euros at 10%. And at the end of the year, they got it back, and got 200 million back in Euro, euros and converted it back to dollars, 220. So they made 10%. Their investment on their US six, there was the average, and they had to pay 4%. Now that wasn't too bad. Somehow that doesn't seem as convert, confusing as the other one. Okay, there is a part B to this, of course. Part B says, uh, in this case, if the spot far, foreign exchange rate falls to a dollar to the euro, okay, you're gonna lose on this because a dollar appreciated. It appreciates if you don't have to pay as much for a euro. Same setup over here, same setup over here, but when they convert back, See, because it's dropped, they get back exact. So their gain on the German investment was nothing. 
So they lost money overall. And the final one is, what if it appreciates? And they're going to make a bunch from this. Because when they convert it back, they get a lot more. Because the dollar depreciated versus the euro. It cost us more in dollars to buy a euro, but when we convert back, we get more. Somehow that didn't seem as confusing as the ones in the, the examples, did it? Was that a little better? Mm, good. Okay, let's look at number 13. Number 13 says, Citibank holds 23 million in foreign exchange assets and 18 million in foreign exchange liabilities. They've conducted foreign exchange trading activity in which it bought 5 million uh, foreign exchange contracts and it sold 12 million. What's their net foreign assets? 23 minus 18. What's their net foreign bought and sold? 5 minus 12. What's their net foreign exposure? 5 plus the minus 7. Add those two together. You like that one? Yeah, we like that one. I have not made out the test yet, but I could see where that would be. that would make a good choice. Now, because it's straightforward. Okay, let's look at number 18. Number 18 says, if the interest rate in the United Kingdom is 8% and the interest rate in the U.S. is 10%, and the spot exchange rate is $1.35 to the pound, and interest rate parity holds, what must be the one-year foreign ex forward what must be the one-year forward exchange rate? We're taking that equation and solving for FT, which is exactly what we did. Took that equation, solved it around for FT, plugged everything in. There it is. Y'all can do that. Your algebra skills allow you to do this, right? Remember the rules for solving. Actually, you could, I mean, I, I did this differently here because I think they did too. You could just plug in everything you know in this equation up here. Then simplify everything you can, which would allow you to divide through by that, and you'd be left with that times that, and then divide through by that and get it out. Plug in everything you know, simplify, divide by the coefficient of the, the uh, variable of interest. Remember the rules? <laughs> Substitute everything you know, simplify, isolate the variable of interest, divide through by the coefficient. That's what we're doing. Okay. Number 20. If a bundle of goods in Japan costs 4 million yen, while the same goods and services cost $40,000 in the United States, what's the current exchange rate for U.S. dollars for yen? Ten, a penny to the yen. That was easy. Um, if over the next year inflation is 6% in Japan and 10% in the United States, what will the goods cost next year? Well, they'll cost there times 06 and they'll cost that. It is, the exchange rate is now going to be 0 0.0104. The dollar is going to depreciate versus the yen. It's going to cost us more dollars to buy a yen. I think the thing about the depreciate and ap appreciate part that's hard is if the exchange rate goes up, it's depreciated. It, it, it seems like it's backwards, but it's not. The dollar has depreciated because it costs more dollars to buy a yen. Now think about that for a minute. Yeah. The other rate, yeah. Well, if you went the other way, One divided by that. Minus six. I want to divide this one up here. Remember, all you have to do to change them the other way is just divide. Okay. Get my little thing back. So that's yen to the dollar. This is dollars to yen. That's yen to the dollar. All you have to do is just flip them over. So if, if you look at it that way, it kind of makes sense. It was 100 yen. These are not dollars, they're yen. Um, 100 yen to the dollar. Now they're 96 yen to the dollar. That makes sense? Okay. I think I've confused you enough for tonight. My work is done. <laughs> I, really, I hate to stop so soon, but I've talked fast enough. 
I, I, yeah, I have. I do suggest you can't go look at 910, but these that are out there as examples, they are they are following exactly the examples in your book. 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96, exactly following the examples. So let's talk about them again next week, and I will be ready to talk about the test next week, which would probably be of more interest. Okay, y'all, don't freeze out there. <laughs>